when we put one power session after the other, uh, and we want to end up with one, but uh, I just have to tell you that uh, you know uh, we had expected Barka to come and moderate this session, but she had always told us that if there was some news item or others which came, then she would not be able to you know to be here with us. Uh, we have not been able to reach her, so I'm sure you know I, I think she's stuck up you know with. Uh, you know, something which is uh, important. So we're going to do this in a slightly different way. Uh, Rama Bijapurkar and I will take turns, you know, moderating. We're going to keep it as a discussion. We want to involve the, the uh, audience uh, in, this, in this discussion. Sorry. We're going to involve the audience in this discussion. Now, this session was actually conceived by my good friend Rama Bijapurkar and Vinita Bali. And they thought it would be useful for us to reflect on some of the ethical dilemmas that we face as individuals and corporates face. And we took as our basic Gurcharan Das's book the difficulty of being good. And we're very, very pleased that Gurcharan himself has agreed to participate in this session you know, with us. I want to mention that Gurcharan's book is available outside. For those of you who want it, you know, he will sign it for you. It's available at the Crossroad uh, Bookshop, as well as in the Haji Ali Juice Center corner next to the Goli Vada Pav. You know? So you can pick up those books there, and Gurchan is very happy you know, to sign them for you after the session. So with that, why don't I invite our eminent panel to the stage. Rama, can you join me? OK. Gurcharan. Dr. Kiran Bedi. Minita Bali. Oh, Minita. Shekhar Gupta. Captain Gopinath. Shafi Mather, and of course me. I think most of the people here, you know, uh, need very little introduction, and you know there is a sheet which I think you, you, you were given this morning as to what this, uh, you know. Uh, discussion is all about. I'm going to ask my co-host, and we only decided that in the last 15 minutes, my co-host Rama Bijapurkar, uh, to say a few words because, as I said, she and Vinita had spent some time, you know, con conceiving this. Talked to Gurcharan, who very kindly agreed, you know, to do this, and then it was a question of me getting this group of people together to have this open discussion on what I think is a very, very important subject, you know, for a country like India. Since we're running way over time, I think we should, I should stick to a few words. And uh, the panel's introductions are in the sheet that is with you. And uh, we really wanted this to be a town hall kind of session, which is uh, thoughtful and has the maximum possible audience participation. And uh, so I think we'll kick off with uh, Gujaran. Uh, who, um, uh, after who, in honor of whose book, or after who's inspired by whose book, we actually have the title of this session, The Difficulty of Being Good. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rama. You have honored me. And uh, Sridhar, you have organized. Um, you know, as we... This particular session, I'll speak for about 10 minutes to lay the context. And then um, this, actually, it was supposed to be Barkha's job to uh, anchor and lay out the issues that we were going to discuss. But nevertheless, in this 10 minutes, I will raise the issues which are also in this sheet uh, that you have before you. <clears throat> so let me begin. As we approach the end of the decade, there are two trends that are clearly visible. One is the economic rise of India. Prosperity is spreading, and India too, like many nations of east of us, will become a middle-class country in the next two to three decades. Now, that is the good news. The second trend is the rise in corrup corruption. And the lazy-minded connect these two trends and when, when, in fact, they are totally independent of each other. Now, when I speak about corruption, I'm not thinking of a politician who's caught with a bribe. Madhu Koda. I'm thinking of every single transaction that a citizen has with the state primary health center. And one out of three nurses is absent in a primary health center. And 69% of the medicines are stolen from primary health centers. Every Indian, once in his or her lifetime, has to change the name of your property. Every Indian, this is when your father dies, every Indian has to pay a bribe to a talati or a patwari or whatever the revenue official is. Delhi has, is endowed with more water than almost any city in the world. 300 liters per person per day after we have built Sonia Vihar. Paris is 155, London is 169. Paris and London give water 24 hours a day. Delhi gives water on the average four hours a day. And Delhi has five times the employees per meter than most cities in the world. Delhi Jal Board. Anyway, I could go on and on with this. You know, you get what I mean. Now, governance has two dimensions. One is obviously the institutional dimension. That if you could punish a school teacher who doesn't show up, the school teacher will show up. But will that school teacher teach with motivation and inspiration? That's the question of dharma. So there's a moral failure in all this. And that's what I was interested in. My book is One Man's Search for Dharma in this ambiguous moral climate of India. And dharma is not only private virtue, but also civic virtue. So why did I turn to the Mahabharat? One, because the Mahabharat is unique in engaging with the world of politics. Two, Mahabharat is obsessed with dharma. Three, nobody, no character when they gets into trouble in Mahabharat, do they say, let's ask God. You're left to your own devices, unlike in Christianity or Islam. You're left in your own devices to figure it out. And what does this do? This improves your moral reasoning. And moral reasoning is the beginning point of good moral action. So let me illustrate how I go about this. Now, you know, every child knows that in the Mahabharat, Yudhishthir gambles away his kingdom which is lost in a rigged game of dice to the Kauravas. And the punishment of the Pandavas is they have to go in exile 
in the forest, in the Dvaita forest one day, Draupdi sees her husband and she says to him, My Lord, I have seen you sleeping on sheets of silk and pillows of goose down. By the way, they had goose down pillows in the Mahabharata. It's not just in Bloomingdale's that you buy them. And she says, what kind of world is this? That for no reason at all, we have, our kingdom has been stolen in a rigged game of dice. So she tells her husband, she has a, like a good manager, she has a bias for action. And she says, now let's go and win back our kingdom. And that's your dharma. You're a kshatriya, you have to wage a just war. But he says, no, my dharma is that I have given my word to Dhritarashtra to go in exile. And so you see in the Mahabharata, there's a wonderful conflict between two meanings of dharma, which is driving the epic forward. And so she says, but what is your dharma? What is? And he says, it's goodness. And he says, she says, but what's the point of being good? When the bad guys are the people who are living in our palaces, they're living in Malabar Hill, and here we are, worse than Dharvi, that we are... Is this the fate of people in the world, that the good people suffer and the bad people are... And so, this is one issue. I think our panel is going to discuss that is the nature of the world that goodness is not rewarded sufficiently? If you ask the Tatars and the Infosys people, they would tell you that it is, that their reputation is built on integrity and that helps them bring more business. But I think that's one issue that our panel could easily discuss. And, but you know, you ask an Indian mother, no Indian mother calls her son Yudhishthir, almost no one. Whereas every fifth one is an Arjun. The mothers obviously decide that to be, to be a winner, to be CEO material is better than to be good. But this is a question. Um, this is a question that uh, we want to ask. Is, can a CEO be successful and good with Ahimsa, Satya, all the qualities that Yudhishthira talks about at the same time. At another point in the epic, Draupdi is asking, also, what is this meaning of being good? You know, and Vidura, you remember Vidurniti? Vidura, who we all like as a character, Vidura says, well, goodness is very simple. You act so that you benefit the maximum number of people through your actions. The greatest good for the greatest number. The utilitarian idea, which is very different from Yudhishthir's idea of being good, where he says, I act because I must. Meaning, to be good is a duty. Vidura's idea is you look at the consequences of an act, and you see, if it has benefited the most people, you call it good. That's the ruler's sort of niti. Whereas Yudhishthir says, you look at the motivation. And you know, when I was writing this chapter in my book, I read, I think in the Indian Express, there was a story about a child who was almost drowned in the beach in Goa. And the reporter, and, 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 and a man from Delhi saved that child from drowning. 
and the reporter from Indian Express went to this fellow and he said, but why did you do it? You're a hero. And he very sheepishly said, shall I confess? He said, I was, I'm from Hindu college in Delhi and we have come with a school, with a college uh, group and I was trying to impress a girl who was in our party. And then the reporter says, but then you're not a hero. But Vidura would have said, the child was saved. So he is a hero. You look at the consequences. Of course, Yudhishthir would have jumped in the sea even if nobody was looking. So that is the kind of moral reasoning that the Mahabharat forces on you. That would you torture one child to save a million children? And, and so on. Anyway, before I get too far, very quickly I want to, because we want to come into a discussion, I want to give you one more example. And this is a, the hero in the Mahabharat that we all love, and that is Karna. In fact, he's a, such a tragic hero that I wonder why Indian mothers call their children Karna or, or Karan. It's me about Karan. You remember the story? Kunti has a child by accident, she's ashamed, she floats that child in a basket and it's picked up by a charioteer and is brought up as a charioteer's son. What interests me here really is the notion that Karna wants to be a Kshatriya. He wants to be treated like an Kshatriya, but he's treated like an OBC, a charioteer's son. And what it brought for me was the pain in our lives, pain of being an OBC. And particularly, you know, it also shows how we all human beings want to be somebody. We don't want to be a nobody. We come into this gathering and we want people to smile at us rather than look right through us. And snobs in particular have an enormous capacity for inflicting pain on others. And many of you will remember that in the Mahabharat, Karna goes to the Swayamvara of Draupadi and he picks up the bow, hits the target and he's the winner. And suddenly Draupadi says, I won't marry an OBC, I won't marry a Sutaputra. And today, Sutaputra is a term of abuse in villages of India. And so, the, there's this undercurrent of sexual desire that drives Karna's story right through the Mahabharat. But, I mean, that's not what I want to focus on. What I want to focus here on is that the idea that our self-esteem is held hostage to the opinion of others. That we, this is for the, this is the human condition. None of us can escape status anxiety. That is Karna's problem, status anxiety. And my aunt used to say that you would not worry what others think of you if only you realize that they don't. That in fact, they are thinking of what others are thinking of them and they are thinking what others are thinking of them. So that is the human condition that we all are so worried. What are, as, as babies, this is not a problem. We cry, we burp, we break our toys, our mothers love us. But when we grow up, the world judges us and that's status anxiety. Anyway. The end, I mean, Karna's story is such a wonderful story because Krishna dis decides that the war is inevitable, the peace negotiations have broken, and the Pandavas are going to lose unless they can get Karna to switch sides. So he goes to Karan and he says, he tells him who he is, that you are not only a Kshatriya, but you're a royal prince. You come on our side, 
you will be the eldest son of Kunti. Therefore, you will be the king, not just a Kshatriya. And we are going to win this war. And then he says that one side Yudhishthira will stand on you, the other side Arjuna will stand, they will fan you, and the Chhatri will be on your head. And Draupadi will be yours, the ultimate prize. Of course, Karna does not switch sides. And you know what he says? He says that your real mother is not the one who gave birth to you. The real mother is the one who brings you up. And what a wonderful blow against the caste system that he delivers every day. I would repeat this in our country. The Mahabharata is a dark story. But in this, everybody dies, as you know. But in this darkness, the Mahabharata is able to snatch victory. Is able to snatch victory in stories like this, the ideals that people like Karana hold. And you remember at the end of the epic, and this is, I'm coming to the end. At the end of the epic, Yudhishthira is going to heaven and a stray dog attaches itself to Yudhishthira. They arrive at, in the heaven. Indra comes out and he says, welcome great king. Indra is the heaven keeper. And, in, and Yudhishthira, instead of going into heaven, says, but what about this dog? And Indra says, this is heaven, no dogs allowed. And besides, he's not even your dog. He's just a street dog, dirty. And listen to what Yudhishthira says. He refuses to go in. And he says, that this is not the place for me. Because Dharma says that you, if somebody comes to you for refuge, you help them. So this is how the Mahabharat, what it's saying is that maybe an act of goodness is one of the truly valuable things that we have on the earth. That we are all in the gutter, but maybe some of us are looking at the stars. Thank you. Um, I actually want to toss this to Dr. Kiran Bedi. Um, do you believe looking at uh, your career and all the situations you've been in, the ups and the downs, the difficult times, the good times. Do you believe, as the question Gurcharan asked, is goodness rewarded sufficiently? And I've often wanted to uh, ask you, do you have difficulty being good? Are there times when you really, I mean, what are the situations where you really feel that it is difficult to be good? And I think that uh, that and, and do you also believe the other question that Gurcharan's been asking, the greater good theory, that some things are okay as long as they do result in the greater good, so? That's interesting, breaking ice straight away. Um, thank you for making it easy if you're going to be asking from my personal experience. I think I'm a product of the challenge to good. I would not have been what I am if the goodness had not been challenged. And that is what helped me in my career. Every time I wanted to, many times, not every time, uh, many times when I wanted to, went to stick to the right thing, I was challenged. And the fact that I was challenged, uh, it enabled me to realize myself who I am, how much stamina I have, how much determination I have, and how far I can go, and whether I can survive. And the fact that when I walked to the stage, the, the, the ovation or the cheer we got is a reward, is a reward for me, because otherwise it should have been booted out and should have been booted out. <clears throat> to me, this is a recognition that even though I left the service two years earlier on principle, that it was the right decision. I'll narrate two, three incidents where I was challenged, and I think in the end, I would look back as one of the finest decisions I took. Every time I think, uh, I believe I stood my ground is only when my staff was being wrongly suspended. If you look at my book called I Dare, there are two, three chapters which depict this analysis. How many minutes do I get? Three, two? How many minutes? 
Four? Okay. <clears throat> so, so let me narrate this incident within these four minutes, because we are quite an interesting panel, and I would love to listen to everybody else. Uh, is that I remember when I was leaving police training, and I was being posted as Inspector General Chandigarh, which is Shekhar City. Um, I said before going, it was, became very ominous, that I am, that's the first time I was going to get a city charge as Inspector General of Union Territory of Chandigarh. And it was a city of my student days. I loved that city and um, had walked and cycled every inch of it. So I was one day dreaming that I'll, I'll serve the city. And when I was getting a farewell from my parade, I said, I'm going to Chandigarh, and I will now test myself whether I'm able to stand up to all that I'd been saying all this while, because this is the first time I was going to head a police force as the Inspector General. It became very ominous. And I said this, that here I am, where I would probably test myself whether I can live up to all that I'd been saying all these years. And what had I been saying? I'd been saying whether uh, only that Inspector General of Police is capable of leading a force who stands up by the force when it is the most difficult situation, and which is particularly a question of ethics. So I went to Chandigarh. I loved that place. We got on to the task. We started to deliver results. And within days, three, four of my very senior police officers were placed under suspension for acts done 15 years ago of which I was not aware, and a home secretary, who happened to be a woman, suspended past the orders, and it never came to me as Inspector General. It came to me through a newspaper called the Tribune. So the Tribune rings me up to saying, Madam, do you know some of your officers have been suspended? Senior, and Chandigarh, being a small city, did not have many officers. And I, it came as a shock to me that out of, let's say, eight key officers, I'm losing 50% for something which had happened during terror times 15 or 10 years ago. And coming through a newspaper, I thought that was absolutely discourteous, that you don't take, the Home Secretary doesn't take the Inspector General into confidence and consults me to say, can I, sus I'm suspending your officers, because I had to issue the orders of suspension. So the suspe officers were not suspended. Officers were, through media reports, placed under suspension. Now these four officers came running to me, saying, ma'am, are we suspended? I said, I don't know, but for what? They said, we don't know, but the orders have come, so you have to pass the orders. I said, I will not pass the orders. I shall not. And I'd been Inspector General just for about three, four weeks, and we had been started to turn the city around. We had won over the people, and we'd put systems in place. I said, I will not pass these orders till I know the reason for which. And imagine. This was my first, first posting as Inspector General, something I was looking forward to, city which had warmed up to me, city which had been changed around. I said, I will um, meet the right people. I wasn't getting access to the Home Ministry at all, because this is the issue of IAS and the IPS. The Home Ministry is all Indian Administrative Service. We, back in the police, is the Indian Police Service. Hardly have access as easily as anybody else. I could not access even the Joint Secretary to find out why are my people being suspended. Now, I went up to the uh, Commissioner. Commissioner wouldn't listen to me because it is the Home Secretary. They're part of the same clan. I asked to meet the Governor of Chandigarh, and I, that was General Chibber. And I said, sir, I understand that you're placing these, these people as being suspended. Is this ethical? Isn't there something called Inspector General? Should I not know why they're being suspended? And now that I know what they're being suspended, I don't, I don't, I will not issue these orders, sir. I wish to let you know, I am the captain of a ship. This ship is mine. I take responsibility for it. I want to know, I want to be convinced too whether this was really an error. Give me some time. I want to look at it. And if they were really malafide, I'll let them go. But till I'm really convinced morally, morally, I will not pass the order. He said, do you know what it means? I said, Sir, that's exactly what I've come here for, to let you know what it means. It means my exit. It means my exit, even though I was looking forward to the city. I am now living up to exactly what I'd been saying all these years. Friends, nobody heard me. Nobody heard me. I did not pass these orders. That was the last time the government of India allowed me to head a police force, because this was the rule. Rule is. We do, we issue the orders, you obey, 
you are not you are leader only in position you are not re leader in re tr truly a moral authority i let that job go i rang up the home ministry mr advani was then the home minister and i told mr advani i said mr advani you are the one who sent me to chandigarh you suggested i come to chandigarh now i want you to bring me back i don't want to work in the system where i have to be i am a leader in only position but i'm not leader in moral authority i'm sorry i'll not suspend officers and lead this force because i'm actually i'm not worth being a leader i want to come back i was brought back went back to training i'm only giving you one of the many instances this has been the way i led the police force throughout and that is why even at the last stage when i quit the service 2 years earlier it was exactly on those grounds so my friends i my coming to the next question i personally believe we all live with ourselves we decide what integrity means to us and i believe integrity has three implications one we are integral we have honesty or integrity of thought for our own selves two we have integrity of thought for our immediate family the reputation of the family one for our own selves what our belief is secondly when we have integrity we integ have integrity for our own family family which is living a family which has gone by like for instance my actions i love them to be clean even though my mom's gone even though my father's old i want to stay with that belief or the right integrity for the love of my own family or the reputation of my own family and the third reason for which we have we exercise integrity or we choose to have integrity at any cost at any cost but it's actually no cost i'll in, in the end say that but the third reason i think we exercise integrity is for larger good the third aspect of that integrity i did it for larger good i did this action i'm giving you only one example of chandigarh is first i did it for myself because that's the way i was i felt i was a leader within myself second i did it because my family would have looked said what a shame you suspended police officers just because you wanted to stay in that position what would my mother and father say and the third reason was for larger good of my police force what what would man what would the force do if i would do it that's a wrong principle that's not the way and finally was this is what i'd been saying this is what i would have loved to see every police officer if the sis junior is right to stand up for that junior friends if you ask me in the end was i a loser for this or not no way listen inspector general shipper would have gone for 2 years and done and forgotten but the fact that every time i'm back in chandigarh i have to only step my foot at the railway station and the the way the cops come running to me the way they love me and the way they respect me to my mind this is living in their hearts forever to my mind therefore i am so happy that i was challenged all the time i am a product of the challenge i'm so glad that i was challenged that i could challenge myself and really judge whether i was worth my upbringing whether i was worth my education and worth my education so i think that's the key it is you don't live to please others first of all you are honest you are you are clean you are fair for your own self for your own family and for your belief for your larger good so in the end i think i'm a huge gainer for having been consistent in my in my life in in my professional life in particular and my personal life in special thank you very much sir kiran kiran would have given her son the name yudhishthir yeah you know i think thanks for that very impassioned sort of uh, you know uh, statement about you know the the nature of integrity the personal accountability that you took upon yourself i want to shift slightly but stay on the same side of the panel gopi i want to ask you you know in corporate life and in business life you know there are ethical dilemmas and challenges you know that people face can you sort of share the kind of dilemmas that you see where you would draw the line you know what's acceptable not acceptable so if you could share some of your thoughts on that with us i think uh, it's uh, fair to say that there is uh, rampant corruption uh, and it is not true today uh, in canada there is a very famous uh, uh, carnatic uh, classical composer called purandara dasa 
He said, Satyavantarige idu kalavalla. That is what, you know, 700 years ago. This is not it. This is not the age for honest people. So I think dishonesty and corruption and these kind of issues has been there throughout history. And we, we are all, to a great extent, uh, we are either perpetrators or uh, beneficiaries or victims of the system. Uh, a large number sometimes are victims and many of us are uh, perpetrators and, and beneficiaries. In, you know, uh, you, I, I know a lot of people who will, who will bribe the corporation when they are registering the house. I think it's very few people you come across who will not bribe uh, a corporation uh, sub-registrar when you are registering your property, your own personal property. I have seen police officers, IAS officers, judges, uh, including myself. We say, okay, hell with it, you know. There's an euphemism. You get an incidental charge from the chartered accountant or the lawyer. He doesn't call it bribe. He says, these are the charges, sir. We take care of everything. So, I think this is a real serious issue. But of course, like someone said, it's all the question of degrees. Uh, where you uh, are corrupt in a manner where you are ashamed of, uh, where you are corrupt in a manner where uh, you are perpetrating it uh, on others. Uh, but uh, I just want to share one or two incidents because you know, I, when I left the army, I left it 6,000 rupees and I took to farming as I said in the afternoon and I got into debt like all other farmers and got out of debt. And I remember even in those days when I went to the electricity board, I went to the sub registrar's office, there was no way you could get anything done without bribing. And I would say I will never bribe under any circumstance. And because I was an officer, I had some access, I would go walk into the DC's office, the police officer's office, I would get my job done. Uh, but at times, you know, you'd be frustrated and you say, hell with it. And, and you know, your crop is there and you're, you're going to die, your family is going to uh, you know, starve and you, you have to get an electricity board connection. Maybe, you know, I would have looked the other way and said, okay, pay him thousand rupees and, and get the water to my farm. So in that sense, you know, I have been a coward. But uh, to a large extent, you know, if you stand your ground, even though there is corruption, even though politicians take money, if you stand your ground, uh, even today in India, uh, you can get things done. So when I got my helicopter company license, it took me three years. We applied in 1995 and we got the license in 1997. Two years, ten months. Because license Raj is truly a license Raj in aviation. Uh, it's very tightly controlled and people sell the license. In those days they would say, if you import a 50-seater aircraft per seat, you have to pay so much. And of course, I didn't have the money. I don't know whether I would have paid if I had the money, but I didn't have the money to pay. And we just decided, Captain Sam and I, that we will not pay under any circumstances. And I don't even naming the name. I went to Delhi quite a few times. Obviously, if you go to Delhi with your back bent, uh, cringing, fawning, there will be a Kapoor there or a Chawla there or a Nair there who will come and say, I'll do your job. Uh, which means that he will ask you for some money. Uh, part of it he'll keep it and part of it he'll pass on to the bureaucrats and ministers. Uh, I mean, but if you go uh, with determination not to pay, uh, nobody will approach you. By your demeanor, they can make out, uh, they'll not come to you. So I remember uh, this joint secretary whom I kept going, by the time you went back, uh, the third time the joint secretary is changed. So then you start all over again. So finally, when I kept going back, there was a secretary for aviation who told me that, uh, Captain, your file has been uh, sent to the minister. Don't come and bug me anymore. I said, then get it signed. And you know, I was talking that the way I talk. You know, I was very aggressive. I was not studying him. And I would call him Mr. So-and-so. I said, then Mr. Uh, I don't remember his name now. I said, can you get it signed? The minister that time was uh, Gulab Nabi Azad. This is not to testify that Gulab Nabi Azad is corrupt or dishonest. But what I want to tell you is what exactly happened. 
So the secretary said, look, this file is gone. I'm not going to go to the minister again because if I go, the minister will suspect me of having a personal motive. But I think he's expecting, he stopped there, meaning that he's expecting something from me. He said, probably he's expecting to see you because he has not rejected the file. He has not approved the file, which means he has kept it in a painting tray. So I walked into Ugazam uh, Nabi Azar's office by talking to the secretary. My army uh, life helped me when I said I'm a captain from the army. He called me in and I said, Mr. Gulab Nabi Azad, your prime minister has been talking from the rooftops that you are all for reforms. And I said, I've been coming to Delhi for the last three years and my file is not getting signed. I'm only coming to you now because it is uh, three years now. He said, Captain, calm down. He says, why, why are you shouting at me? What, what exactly is the issue? I said, my file has not been signed. He said, I'm going to go bankrupt even before I launch. He says, where is the file? Maybe he knew it. If he knew it, he didn't show it. So I said, this is on your table. That's what the secretary tells me. So he called the secretary and said, where is this, where is this captain's file? And, and I just you know, sent off a litany of uh, uh, you know, four-letter words. I was really upset because I was at the end of my tether. And, and he said, why didn't you come to me earlier? I was totally flummoxed. I said, I should have gone to him earlier, but I, know, I could never go to him earlier because you can't go to your minister unless the file goes to him. Because it was a, you know, we were going around in circles. You get the home ministry clearance, the DGCA clearance lapses. You get the DGCA clearance, the civil aviation ministry clearance lapses. So we were going around in circles. Anyway, he pulled out the file and he said, here it is, take it. So I got uh, my license. Uh, of course we know there is corruption. Of course we know ministers take money, but he must have thought, Forget it, I'll take it from the Birlas or the Ambani's or somebody else, but I will not take from Captain Gopi. So, what I want to say is that, like she said, it is for you to uh, fight for it. It is, is the truth, it's God's own truth, I'm not exaggerating. And much later, when I became quite successful and well known, after I started a Deccan, one uh, member of parliament, I think we're just, uh, I don't want to invite uh, contempt of charge, what is this, uh, from the house, uh, contempt of uh, the parliament, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, for the parliament there is, yeah. Uh, the, you know, there was a member of parliament, I think an ex-member of parliament, my secretary kept saying, he's calling non-stop to meet you, so I thought he wanted a ticket to, you know, all these places where nobody else was flying except Deccan, so they were not getting seats, and typically they would call me and I would, I would uh, try and accommodate them. And uh, so finally, he said, no, he wants to meet you. So I went uh, and he came to my office and he said, uh, there's another dilemma I'm just giving. I'll take two more minutes. Uh, he said, Captain, you know, I was uh, with one of the ministers. I don't want to give the name, but I'll give another name of the minister. And he said, uh, uh, he asked me, how is Captain Gopi? Is he good? Is he a good man? And this man said, yes, he's a, he's a good, good fellow. I know him very well. How long have you known him? He says, 10 years. Can you trust him? He says, yes. Uh, then he said, why are you asking? He said, you know, Captain Gopi's import permission for 60 Airbuses has come. Uh, you know, it has to, you know, get sanctioned so I can help him. So, and then he said, you know, Captain, you know, you know what it means. You know, maybe you should give, I don't know, I'm not suggesting maybe two crores, three crores, four crores. I leave it to you. You know what are the value of uh, 60 Airbuses? It's worth about 10,000 crores. The import permission, if they delay. Uh, I said, look, he doesn't sign the file. It doesn't go to him. I said, it goes to Chidambaram. But he said, it'll never go to him. You know, he will put obstacles in your way. He knows how to put obstacles in your way. It'll never go. Maybe he'll also get it done by Chidambaram. But you please go and meet him. This is my advice, but I leave it to you. You know, you're a businessman, you understand these things. So, my suggestion is just, you know, Settle something, you know, and it'll happen. So I was, you know, in sleepless night because uh, my whole company could have got uh, uh, gone bankrupt if I didn't get this license. You know, I can't transfer the money. Uh, Reserve Bank permission, Reserve Bank requires a, a, a permission from the finance ministry. So whole night I did not sleep. I did not know whether I should take on this challenge and risk the company or do the Vidura way or the <laughs> Yudhishthira way. And, uh, you know, then, you know, I 
spoke to my uh, directors on the board and one of them said, uh, this captain or the investor, he said, look, forget all this. You know, this is a given. Uh, you just pay something and see how much, how, how less you can pay. And sorry, doctor. So I, you know, did not like that suggestion. I thought they'll all tell me, forget it, let the company go bankrupt. You will not pay. Uh, of course, you own my own. I would have also gone bankrupt. So then I, call, I went to Delhi and I knew Chidambaram and I sought a meeting with him. So I went to Chidambaram and as all, many of you know Chidambaram is a very impatient man, he's very arrogant uh, and very stubborn sometimes and hence very knowledgeable. And so I said, Mr. Chidambaram, you know, these rules are so cumbersome. Why does this aircraft have to come to you every time? Why can't you change the rules? He said, don't teach me how to run my ministry, Captain. I'm not going to change the rules. When your files come, I always clear it. I cleared it last time. He said, no, the files will not come to you. Now it's almost three months. And you know, I have to pay a huge amount of deposit. I've already recruited pilots. I've recruited engineers. You know, it's a, it's a big risk for me. So I'm just requesting you to change the rules. I was not coming to the point. He says, come to the point. I'm not going to change the rules. He said, no, I was told that the files will never come to you. He said, why are you saying that? So I was told that if I don't pay the money, the files will not come to you. So, he's, so he said, who told you this? So I said, so and so. He said, give me the name. So I was hesitant uh, because I thought, you know, suppose if he doesn't do the job, I'll be in more trouble. You know, because if he doesn't follow through, the minister doesn't follow through, I'll be in more trouble than otherwise. So I gave him the name and he said, if by chance I come to know you pay, uh, I'm, I'm going to ensure that, that you're going to get blacklisted in the ministry. So I said, no, I said, but make sure you do my job, I said. <laughs> So I left the uh, 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 office and as I was boarding my flight back to Bangalore, I got a call saying that your file has been cleared. Uh, please come and collect the file. So <laughs> what I want to say is that uh, uh, I don't want to be a holier than thou. I mean, uh, all of us are, uh, we have to look at ourselves. Uh, like Gothe said that if all the thoughts that come Go, th go through our mind, uh, if it's recorded, I think most of us will be in jail. <laughs> so, uh, but I think it is possible uh, in India with all the corruption. Uh, it, it is a social churning that is going on. Probably they feel justified in being corrupt. But I think it's possible for many of us. Uh, there are good examples here, extraordinary example of Kiran Bedi. For us to do our bit, and I'm sure we can build a better India. That's really awesome. Shekhar, you've often said to me that Bombay and Delhi have to establish diplomatic relations with each other. Shekhar is often of the view that we just don't get it this side of the world. Um, I also know that you're a hard-nosed journalist, but not a cynical one. And I know that you see the good, the bad, and the ugly of all sides and all people. So how do you think about this, and how do you cope? And What's your difficulty in being good? I think, <coughs> can you hear me? I hope acoustics are better now than it's in the morning. I think uh, it's very difficult to put straightforward dictionary definitions to the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, what is good at any point of time depends on your situation then and conflicts of interest that you face. Uh, so you choose what is the best option, it may be the least worst option sometimes. And sometimes you make compromises because you look at the larger common good or you see uh, what is it that's going to, am I going to be, am I going to just look good doing something and thereby hurting other people? Uh, Gocharan, if I may say so, that's the reason nobody remembers Sudhishthar because he was a great hypocrite. Uh, he gave away his wife in gambling. It doesn't matter if it was, uh, he was gambling. It doesn't matter if it was fixed. Uh, he didn't fight the war. He got his younger brothers to fight the wars. He was a weak man. Uh, so just because you do something virtuous or you're seen to be doing something virtuous, you don't become acknowledged as someone who did something good. I mean, look at another great character from one of our other great epic, uh, Ramayana, uh, Vibhishan. Uh, he did all the right things. If, in fact, if you read Ramayan, if you see Ram Lila every year, as many of you may have done, Vibhishan is a nice guy who goes and recognizes Ram 
as the Lord says, I am doing all this at the feet of Lord Ram, etc., 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 and yet no mother in India has ever named his, her son Vibhishan because he was a traitor. You know, he may have been doing the right and virtuous thing, but he was a traitor. So honor doesn't always come. Uh, honor is not uh, bestowed upon you just because you seem to be doing what you see to be the good thing irrespective of its consequence to other people who depend on you or who trust you. So it's a dilemma. You know, it's a dilemma all of us face in our lifetimes, in our professions. I mean, I face them very often. Uh, I mean, I lie all the time, and people ask me, who, what is the source of such and such story? I say, I don't know, right? Or uh, sometimes I say, I will not tell you. Right? Uh, there was one case uh, where we were facing a criminal case uh, in a story, and we came to a point where the judge might have asked me for the source of the story, because uh, under Indian law, protection of source is not codified. Uh, under Indian law, uh, freedom of... Uh, the press is not codified. It is guaranteed by Article 19 of the Constitution as it is guaranteed for any of you. You, uh, you have freedom of expression. Rest is done through uh, judicial record and judicial tradition and the case law as settled by Supreme Court. And I went to see uh, Fali Nariman and I asked Fali Nariman, I said, what are my choices? He said, look, if the judge asks you that you have to tell the source because disclosing the source is important for solving a criminal case that you have no choice but to tell him. And I said, what is my other choice? He said, your choice is either to tell the judge that, look, I can't tell you. You can punish me, and it's a bad law. Then you get punished for tampering with evidence. Right? It's a bad law. Uh, or you can write your source on a piece of paper and give it to the judge in a sealed cover. So I said, look, I hope I don't come to that. But from then on, I made a rule, and the rule is when one of my reporter brings a story, unless I really need to know, I really need to know if I'm suspicious, I'm doubtful. Uh, you know, all of us uh, have sort of suspicion written in our DNA as reporters. And as we become editors, we, we become impossible. And if I want to see the motives of a particular source, only then I ask the reporter the source. Otherwise, I don't ask. Because then when I'm summoned to a court of law, I want to be able to put my hand on the Gita and say, I don't know the source. So I don't have to lie, right? But I don't tell the truth because I don't know the truth and I've taken care not to know the truth. The good thing would have been for me to know the truth, but I don't do the good thing. Uh, I do the correct thing. Now, you face these dilemmas all the time. And I'll tell you a couple. Uh, about in 1997, uh, 12 years back, 50th anniversary of our independence, uh, Times of India and Hindustan Times were carrying out big, huge, 100-page, 200-page supplements on the 50th anniversary of independence. If you see the Express, you know we don't get that many ads, and we don't do so many sponsored features. So uh, our marketing people said, you know, we look very bad. So we also thought that we should do something that only we can do on the 50th anniversary of independence. So we said, look, no national paper has an edition in Kashmir. So on the 50th anniversary of independence, Indian Express will launch an edition from Kashmir. So we launched an edition from Jammu. Now, there, was, there were no journalists there. So we were sending a lot of our young people from Delhi for two weeks at a time who will go and work and bring out the paper. Now, young people being young people, there was one car, one old Maruti van. So they started driving out at night, and they would do it almost every night, to a place called Patni Top, which is the highest point between Jammu and Srinagar to watch the sunrise. So they'll finish their work at 1, 1.30, and then drive to this place to watch the sunrise and come back in time so that nobody would know they had taken the car. One day that car rolled down the cliff and landed at the bottom of the mountain. What did I have? I had one dead journalist, 23 years old, <clears throat> If you come to our newsroom, you will see her picture on the wall. And I had three others injured, one of them critically injured, another 23-year-old girl, critically injured with a spinal fracture. But Indian Air Force doesn't fly after sunset from Udhampur. But if I got Indian Air Force to break the rules, I would also concede a big IOU, which I might have to repay someday in my life as an editor. So I had 
I made my choices. I had a young girl's life to save and I had a parents and I thought I was responsible for them. So I called the Air Chief then and I said, Air Chief Marshal, you have to do it for me. And if you don't do it for me, do it for a 23-year-old girl who will die if you don't do it. So he said, you know, Shekhar, how do I do it? <laughs> Today is the 7th October. Tomorrow is the 8th October, which is the Air Force Day. So I'm having big parades and fly paths all over. I have no assets. I said, I don't care. So he got back to me half an hour later because a smart chief, he also wanted the IOU. So he said, I can do it. I can get an AN-32, it's a big plane, to fly from, but it, it's also an air ambulance, to fly from Chandigarh to Udhampur on a training sortie. I'll call it a night training sortie. And they can bring these people to Delhi. And then they are yours. Uh, you pick up the body and you pick up uh, the injured ones. But I have a problem. And I said, hey, Marshal, what is the problem? He said, my problem is that one of your girls is unconscious. Uh, the law doesn't allow me to transport a civilian. I mean, anybody, but particularly a civilian in that state without two paramedics. Only the army has paramedics in Udhampur. So what do I do? So what do I do? I call the army commander in Udhampur at night. General Patnaban, his name I can mention. And I said, sir, do you remember? Your daughter Burns worked for me for a couple of years. He said, yes. I said, you, and you called me, and you said, now that I've got appointed Director General of Military Intelligence, I'm worried about my daughter going to work at night because you have night shifts. At the same time, I can't request you to change her shifts. So do you mind if she resigns? And I, I offered to accommodate, et cetera, et cetera, but you were very honorable. And he said, yes. So I said, just like that, I have another 23-year-old who's dying. Uh, I've got the Air Force to try and save her, but she needs two paramedics to travel with her. So he said, look, under my rules, I can't do it. But I will get two boys to get on that plane. When they come to Delhi, because they will not be on official duty, you make sure they get a couple of blankets and a place to stay. So I said, fine. So we got these people come in, and I must say, uh, the girl who had the spinal injury, she was taken straight to Apollo, and not only did she fully recover, but she was the best dancer at our office parties until she left us. Now, did I do something right? Did I do something wrong? Did I do something good? Did I not do something? I got people to break rules. I broke rules myself to ask for favors. I conceded many IOUs, one of which visited me back very soon. Because for the first time in its history, Air Force had some strikes because engineers were angry. I don't know if you remember. They made many allegations against the Air Chief. I think Air Chief had something to answer for. But every time that the stories came, I got calls saying, you know, but we are such friends. And I knew what the subtext was. So, so you pay a little price. Uh, you don't always do the perfect thing. It is not possible. You know, there can be many other examples, but I, I'll mention two more very briefly.